For all of you not that familiar with TDO, um, I always lecture through TDO uh, because it's just so much better. So I, I have every lecture I've ever given all in TDO backed up every day so I'll never lose it. How many are grad, uh, post-grads? Okay, and how many are new, new, new practitioners? Okay. Uh, I give this lecture every year, uh, and we call it how to, how to Talk to a Patient. And um, I'm in a lot of endodontic offices, and I always like to kind of observe the kind of communication that goes on between the doctor um, and the patient. And um, what, what's clear to me is that in our postgrad programs, they never really teach you how to, how to talk with the patient. And I think during your postgrad years or your first years in practice, um, you really need to refine that art because it is an art. So um, what I thought we'd do, let's, let's just start out with um, what is it that you're trying to accomplish when you talk with a patient? And um, I make this statement. My, my goal when I have a new patient in the office is to make that patient's experience different qualitatively from any experience they have in any other endodontic office. If you can do that, you'll be successful. So that's really what you're trying to do, is to make that experience different, better, more meaningful, higher value. And so it's easy to say this, uh, but it's, it's hard to do it. So the first point of distinction is there's a difference between talking to a patient and talking with a patient. It, there's a difference, and it's important that you understand what that difference is. It's easy to talk to a patient. But what you need to do is you need to talk with them. And that's a completely different kind of conversation. So the first, the first thing to realize is that the nature of that conversation is different than if you're just talking to a person. I want to show you this. Most of you on TDO chat have seen this. But I want you to look at it. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know, in my head, and it's relentless, and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, well, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. So I think it's very important when people, I, I always like to watch. Uh, people's reaction when they see this. Uh, and I think it's very important not to draw the wrong inference from this, because there's a great lesson here for you as a, as a clinician. There's a tremendous lesson, as long as you don't draw the wrong inference from what is really happening here. So um, I have two goals today. The first is, uh, Every conversation with the patient is different. Every single conversation is unique unto itself. So unless you have a conceptual understanding of what it is you're trying to do, 
uh, you'll never get anywhere. You'll have some home runs and some misses, but you'll, you'll kind of flounder. So you need a conceptual understanding of what needs to happen between you and the patient. Uh, and then after we develop that, if, after you develop that understanding, then we can talk about specific things that you can do that can really help. So it's very beneficial to have a conceptual understanding of what has to happen when that patient sits down. It's real simple, right? There has to be trust. You have, you have maybe four or five minutes to, de to, to develop to have that patient develop trust with you. And that is an art. And you will need to understand conceptually how you produce that trust, because you don't know the patient. You don't have the advantage that the general dentist has who has known the patient and developed a relationship. You have three or four minutes, and in that three and four minutes, you have to make it so that that patient trusts you. Because without trust, you, you're dead in the water. So the central problem is how do you develop trust with, with, with your patient? And again, the answer to that is pretty easy. Where does trust come from? Simple honesty. If a patient can detect that you are honest with them, they will trust you. If they detect, detect that you are not honest, they will never trust you. Now, it sounds like a simple thing to do to be honest with your patient, but actually it isn't. It isn't. And most dentists are not honest with their patients. And that's why they don't have trust. Being honest with your patient. They are depending upon you to tell them the truth. So the patient comes in, they just had a crown done, and they're having sweet sensitivity and it's aching. And you look at it and, the, and they say, you know, doctor, is this, is this, does this crown look okay to you? And it's from one of your better referring doctors and it was just put on. The patient wants some honesty from you. You want to protect your referral relationship, don't you? So being honest is difficult. And all of you will be tested very early in your career. Within the first week, you will be tested on whether that honesty is a foundational principle in your office. And, you know, I'm kind of an either-or type of guy. It either is or it isn't. Either honesty is foundational in your office or it isn't. And so you will be tested early and often. And <clears throat> sometimes being honest actually hurts you economically. I, I'd like to make a case that it, that it profits you in the long run. But... So my advice to you is that a foundational principle in your office has to be honesty. And what does that mean? It means at the end of the day, you get all the crappy referral dentists out of your practice. That's what it means. Because you're gonna get those questions and you have, to be on, you have to give honest answers to those questions. So it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. And I've been through this for 15 years with new doctors and it, it's always at the end of the day, you get, you get rid of the doctors who you don't really want to work with because it's hard being honest to the patient when you're working with those kind of doctors. That's, that's the basic lesson on that. So, <clears throat> conceptually, there's two levels of relating with a person, and this is probably the biggest mistake that, that doctors make. They want to relate to the patient as a doctor, and that's a mistake. You have to relate to, to them as a doctor, but later. The first way you have to relate to them is as a human being, not as a doctor. You relate to them as a human being. And um, this takes some effort. It's easy to relate to them 
As a doctor, that's easy. Relating to them as a human being is much more difficult. <clears throat> See, this person talking to this woman was relating to that woman as someone who could fix their problem. What did the woman want? The woman was telling that person what she wanted. What did she want? She wanted to be listened to. She wanted to be related to as a human being, not as someone who could solve their problems. So yes, the purpose of your practice is to solve people's problems. But before you can do that, you have to relate as a human being. And endodontists are not good at this. I can tell you right now, they're not good at it. They think it's about the nail. You think it's about their tooth. It isn't. It's not about their tooth. <clears throat> so, rule number one, conceptually, try to establish rapport with the, as a human being with your patient before you establish rapport as, as a clinician. It's real simple. So, good morning, Mrs. Jones. Tell me about your tooth. No. It's not about the tooth. Good morning, Mrs. Jones. What, tell me about yourself. See the difference? When's the last time you ever went to a physician and had a conversation with them about your life or their life? Have you ever had a conversation with a physician about their life? Actually, it's considered poor practice in medicine to have that kind of conversation with the patient. You're supposed to be detached. But I'm telling you, it won't work for you. You have to relate to them as a person first. <laughs> so good morning, Mrs. Jones. I'm, I'm very happy to see you. Tell me something about yourself. Not tell me about your tooth. There'll, there'll be plenty of time for that later. <clears throat> Has everyone read this book? No? OK. This is Ali Hirsa. She was uh, raised in Salam, uh, so, uh, Somalia, and um, she was genitally mutilated when she was a teenager by, on orders of her father. She was married off as a child bride. Um, she escaped to Germany as a teenager, eventually found her way to Holland, became a Dutch citizen, ran for parliament, won a seat in the Dutch Parliament, made a movie with a Dutch m movie maker that, that revealed some of the bad things uh, about Islam. Her partner in this movie was stabbed on a street in Amsterdam with a knife right through his chest with a note saying that she was next. The Dutch Parliament had to provide her with a 24-hour guard. She had to sleep in a different place every single night for almost a year. Then it became so expensive, she had to leave. She's now in the United States. So the point is, this is a, obviously a woman of very great substance. <clears throat> she tells this story of growing up in Somalia, where she was beaten daily by her grandmother all up till she was uh, early teens. And she was beaten because she could not recall the genealogy of her family back 20 generations. And it was a requirement for all children to be able to recite their entire genealogy back 20 generations. Now, I don't know how far 20 generations is. It must be back to the time of Christ. Uh, I don't know, but it's, it's a lot of memorization. <laughs> And of course, they all learn to do this. And the reason, well, why would you do that? Well, because it's a tribal society, the reason for that is this. When they, you meet a stranger in the desert, and you don't know this stranger, you sit there with that stranger, and you each repeat your genealogy going back until you find a common ancestor. And if you find one, then, you, then you're your friend. If you don't find one, that's your enemy. So this, what I'm saying to you here, is this desire to be part of a common heritage, it simply isn't a cultural thing. It's in our genes. This is part of our molecular makeup. There's no escaping this. 
Everyone is like this. When you get together with people, what do you do? You share uh, people that you like together, movies that you like, music that you like together. What is that? What is that? Does, why do what I care? What kind of music you like? Because it bonds us. It's a common ancestor. So there's a deep genetic purpose to, to being part of the same family. And you need to understand that if you want to establish trust, then you need to find some common humanity with your patient. Because it's, it's an essential human characteristic. There is no escaping this. <clears throat> and if you think about the people you like to be around or, or people that you just meet and you, what that conversation is, what is it? It centers around common things that you, both, that you both like. So if you want to establish trust with your patient, find your common, find your common ancestor. Pretend you're Ali Hirsa in the desert with a stranger. Go through your genealogy. Go, th go through. So <clears throat> what are the things? Common interests, common friends, common situation, common likes, common dislikes, common obstacles, common experiences, common schooling. There's a whole host of things that you can use with your patients to get that bond. That's the first thing I do with the patient is let me find a common ancestor with this patient. And if you can do that, there's a bond there, and it's so much easier to establish trust after you have that bond. <clears throat> I, have, I have trouble with a specific kind of patient. I cannot do this with divorced menopausal females who hate men and grind their teeth. I can't do it. I, I've tried for years. I simply can never find that bond. And I know I don't try anymore because I just strike out. <clears throat> and if someone can find the answer to that, let me, let me know because I would like to be able to do that. I just can't relate. And it's funny. Those patients, they never trust me. And I'm always wary. <clears throat> just about everybody else I'm, I'm pretty good at, but that particular class of patient I, I don't do well with because I can't find a common common thing. I've never been divorced. I love women. I love men. I'm, I don't grind my teeth. I mean, I have nothing in common with this class of patient. <clears throat> Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, the other thing about leadership. <clears throat> in your practice, it's you are better off if you conceive of yourself as a leader because you are a leader. You have to be, you have to be to your patient, you have to be an inspirational leader. Your patient wants to be inspired by you. And I think, I think endodontists have trouble understanding the, the, the role they play. First, they have to be a, they, have to, they have to relate humanly, but then you have to actually be a, an inspirational leader. You have, to, you have to be that person for your staff. You have to inspire your staff. They have to feel that, they have to feel that you are a leader. So it raises the question, well, how, how do you be a leader? <clears throat> It's, it's, it's how you give an account of yourself. And there's basically three ways to give an account of yourself. You can describe what you do, you can describe how you do it, or you can describe why you do it. And it's what, what endodontists typically do when I listen to them, they describe what they do a lot of times they'll describe how, oh, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to take this file, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to inject it, I'm going to do this. Very infrequently do they transmit why they do something. And that's the most important thing to transmit, why you do something. <clears throat> because people don't buy into what you do. They buy into why you do it. <clears throat> so think about this little target. When you're talking with your patient, somehow you need to find a way of why you work the way you do, why it's important to you. 
Most of us in our, in our generation, the newer generation, do you know who this is? Who is it? Martin Luther King. He gave a speech, right? What did he call the speech? I have a dream. He didn't call it, I have a plan, did he? He called it, I have a dream. He, he inspired an entire generation of people, my generation. <laughs> One speech. Millions of people about why, why equal justice was important in a free society. Millions of people were inspired by one speech. And in that speech, all he did was say why, we, why this was important to us. Not, he didn't say what he was going to do. He didn't say how he was going to do it. And you can do that in your practice. <clears throat> so <clears throat> why do you work the day? Because excelling at what we do gives us pleasure. You need to let your patients know this that excelling is important to you. That's why you do this. That's why. Because precision is important. Because doing things right is a foundational principle in your office. You don't want to do it sloppy. <clears throat> because health trumps all other concerns. It trumps money. It trumps time. Health is the most important thing. As far as endodontics go, because long-term results matter more than short-term results. I, I do this every day because the treatments in my office take a long time. I haven't done a one-shot endo in 10 years. My treatments take a long time. I have people in calcium hydroxide for months after months. You know what? It's funny. I never have a patient complain about it. Why? Because before we go through that, I explain about why long-term results are so important to me, that I can't have a failure 10 years later. I tell my patients that. <clears throat> because superior results sometimes takes time and patience. So these are things of why you work the way you do. I'm proud of the way that I work. I want my patients to understand that. Yes, I'll tell them if they're interested, I'll tell them some things about what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it if they're interesting. But I really want them to know why I work the way I do. Because first of all, it's inspirational to them. And it's part of being, a, it's part of being an inspirational leader is that you, you give an account of yourself by, by explaining why you do things. This is another one of my favorite sayings. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. See, how did that guy in the video make that girl feel with the nail in her head? Okay, this is a very, very powerful insight, how you make people feel. How do you make your staff feel? <clears throat> People remember that. I'd like to draw an analogy. You know, I, I have a lot of these younger things. They say, God, they just don't understand some of these older TDOers and perf people. They're, they're so loyal to you, Carr, and you're such a jerk. I mean, I, we don't, they don't understand, you know, this tremendous loyalty of these early perf people. Do you know, you know, when I was doing all that microscope stuff, almost... And I, I ask people, people almost never remember what I said. I had all this research on cadavers and stuff. People don't, they don't remember what I said. But what do they remember? They remember how I made them feel. They re, that's what they remember. That's where that loyalty comes from. Is what was it like to, to uh, feel about your specialty, to feel about how we could do something really well. They remember what that felt like. So how you make your patients feel. This girl with the nail in her head, all he had to do really was listen. He should have listened first, established a human connection, and he could get the nail out of her head. 
But he didn't do that. He started, ah, oh, you got a nail in your head. Let's get it out of there. See the difference? That's the inference you should draw from that. Your patients that come in to see you, they got a nail in there. They got a nail in their tooth. You got to get the nail out, but don't, that isn't the first thing that you need to do. <clears throat> so if you look at these are all pictures from Perf where people have, if you talk to anybody that came out to these courses, they'll just tell you that it, it was a transformative event in their lives. And granted, we taught them how to do, use the microscope, we taught them what to do, but what they really remember is how they felt after the course. How they felt about the, the, the opportunity to really do something well for a change in endo. So how you make your patients feel, I mean, and this was not a posed picture. This is how the, the people felt after the course. So that's where that inspirational leadership came. There were a thousand endodontists that came through that course, and I made sure by the end of that course that they were feeling pretty good. And we didn't do it with alcohol. <laughs> okay. So. When you're starting your practice, now that's conceptually, I hope I've given you some basis conceptually for what you need to do. You make honesty the foundational principle of your office, and when you're tested, you pass that test. Honesty comes before everything else. You establish trust. You establish a common ancestor, a com some common humanity with your patients. And what does this involve? It usually involves sharing something about your life. Share something about you with them. Establish that commonality with them. And that's, that's hard work. That's hard to do that. It takes practice. You have to learn how to do that. How to, how to, how to make that connection with, with, with people on a personal level before you become their doctor, you have to become their friend first. They have to like you, they have to trust you, they have to know that you're going to be honest with you, and you have to do it in three or four minutes. It's really hard. <clears throat> okay. For those of you who are about to start your practice, or are just starting now, just some advice here. Don't delegate. I know what all the practice management people say. Don't delegate. You're tr you have to build a practice. You take the x-rays yourself. Seek the patient yourself. Take the medical history yourself. Don't delegate this to someone else. After you're successful and stuff, you can have other people do it. But when you're building your practice, when you're trying to establish who you are and what you represent in your community, do as much as you can yourself. So what's the, one of the most important things you do is that the first time you greet the patient. It's one of the most important things you do. The two most important things you do in your patient is how you say hello to a patient and how you say goodbye. Those are the two most important things that you do. <clears throat> how you, and if you think about your friends, think about your friends. What do you remember? God, I remember the first time I met them. You remember those things, don't you? Or you remember the last time you, you said goodbye. With Dave Rosenberg, I remember the first time I met Dave Rosenberg. I remember the last time I met him. So this is an actual meeting of a patient. You come in from the front. You don't come in from behind. Smile on your face. So when you're designing your office, don't do this. Don't, don't do this. You're coming in from behind the patient. Why would you want to do that? At least in the physicians in these little cubicles they work at, they at least come through the front door. You know, they, they don't come in from behind. And it's so simple when you're designing your office, just rotate the chair 90 degrees and come in from the front and meet them. Straight on. Meet them with a smile on your face. Make them feel welcome. <clears throat> Body language. 
is important. Not that. So the first time you meet the patient, you're going to give, your, your office gives hints, obviously. And what are the hints you want to give? I am prepared. I am informed. I'm knowledgeable. I'm caring. I'm detail-oriented. I'm interested in what I do. I have the time to listen. I am not distracted. So when you're sitting there talking to the patient about their medical history, you're not sitting there writing something down and saying, oh, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. No. You're just sitting there listening to them. Listen to their story. <clears throat> These are all kind of subliminal things. They're not, they're, they're not things you... you what can really help you, uh, you know, these GoPro cameras are so inexpensive now. Take a GoPro camera and just film yourself for a day. You'll really be surprised at what you see. Film yourself today and then take a look at it of, of what happens with every patient. It's really interesting. <clears throat> So in TDO, TDO was designed to really help you with this. So um, <clears throat> before you walk into the office, these are all of the things that you check. And you can do this very, very quickly. Because what am I looking for? I'm looking for things. First of all, I'm, I want to walk into this operatory and have the patient say, Jesus, how do you? How do you you know all this stuff about me already? You haven't even, I haven't even met you, and you know all this stuff. You know their medical history. You know the drugs they're taking. You know the interactions. You, know, you might know what their hobbies are. You know all these things about them, and you've never even seen them before. Let me tell you something. That's pretty impressive. Already the patient is starting to like you because you're saying to them, Mrs. Jones, welcome to our office. We've been expecting you. See the difference? Instead of walking in, hi, Mrs. Jones, what's happening? See the difference? <clears throat> so all of these things in the record. I like the, I like the occupation thing. And if they even have a business, I go to their website. And it, it sounds like this is a lot of work. God, it takes less than a minute to do this. It doesn't take that long. But I want to know as much about that patient as I possibly can before I walk into the office. You go through the image organizer. This is the entire record of all of the correspondence and everything in the record that you have. And you can go through this very, very quickly. If it's a patient, I, you know, when you've been practicing as long as I have, a lot of your patients are repeat patients. I review this. The patients are amazed that I remember all, of, all that happened on a tooth that I treated 15 years ago. Of course, I don't remember, but I've, I've reviewed it, so I, then I remember it. And I said, oh, I remember that tooth, Mrs. Jones. Do you remember that, th that thing? They're like, how do you remember all this stuff? <clears throat> I said, oh, I have a photographic memory. <laughs> <laughs> so you use, the, you use the image organizer to look at all of the correspondence, all of the pictures, <clears throat> the referral slip. So you're fully thing. If there's bite wings, if you, you, you look at them all, it doesn't take long at all, and you can just scroll right through them. Like, this, was a, th th this is kind of a classic example. Uh, when Linda was checking this patient in, she found out, and your staff can help you with it, that this guy liked, liked classic cars. Well, I worked through school restoring classic cars. So I said, God, I've got, I'm going to establish my bond with this patient in about 10 seconds. No, that's easy. You don't, I don't have to work at all. So you're, all, you're using these things. Another good thing to use is the medical history or even something as simple like if, if they've been in pain all night, just something as simple as, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones, I had exactly the same thing on my thing. I know exactly what you're going through. Just uh, sharing something of yourself that relates you to the patient. <laughs> And of course, using TDO to check for all the drug stuff, that's really important. Patients have a sense of confidence if you're completely informed about their medical condition and the drugs they're taking. 
uh, diseases that they have. You know, if a patient has a rare disease and I don't know what it is, I look that up before I go into the thing and I act like I know what it is. You look it up on and Google. Google is such a great resource for that sort of thing. If they have some kind of rare disease and I don't know what it is, I look it up and I'm informed about it before I walk into that office. <clears throat> okay. The pain history. Um, you know, the patient fills this out on the web, so you don't. You don't have to. Patients don't react very well when they've taken the time to fill a form out and then you ask them the same stupid question. She's already told me the tooth is sensitive to cold. I don't have to say, Mrs. Jones, is it sensitive to cold? And she's thinking, you know, didn't you read the form? Didn't you read my pain history? So it's, it's fine. You say, Mrs. Jones, I understand it's sensitive to cold. It, when I put cold on the tooth, does the pain linger after that or does it go away right away? So you're transmitting to them that you have, in fact, read these things that they have taken the time to fill out. And we're going to go over this in the demo op. Uh, we'll do some, some practice case presentations, but you, you know that's where TDO really shines in how to present a case. And this is the what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Uh, and you can do this, um, you know, in my practice, it's all retreatment. The patient's already had a root canal done, uh, usually multiple times. So um, there's some confusion, usually, on the patient's part. You know, I've had, had this done. Why do I have to have it done again? Um, so the, the presenting a case to that classification of patients is a little different than, you know, presenting one with someone with a pulpal exposure. But... You can use these tools in TDO, and if you don't know how to do that, then come to the demo op, and we'll be doing some case presentations there, so you can kind of see that. This is just kind of a, this is just me presenting it. So you're you're drawing and you're looking at the patient at the same time to to see if it's actually resonating with the patient. I don't need to play through this. I can just kind of scroll through this. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm, I'm drawing and I'm looking at the patient as well using the tooth models. And then what, did you see that? You want that look of understanding uh, when, you, when you do that. Does anybody see anything wrong with this? Exactly. Don't do this. If you're, you're sitting here talking to a patient, this is your world. You need to control this environment, and the patient's like this. You want to be in front of them, eyeball to eyeball. You don't want the patient looking like this. So don't do this. This is not a good way to talk to a patient. This is the way you want to talk to a patient. See how effortless that was? Now I'm facing the patient and being able to communicate with them. Okay. See, we see that I have hundreds of pictures of TDOers like this. So look at the patient's head. That's a no-no. There's Ron. That's a no-no. Look at the patient's head. It's not a good way to communicate. So, that puts a constraint on the design of your op. If I can't move this cart out of the way, I can't swing in front of the patient, can I? So don't make your ops 10 feet wide. Don't put a cabinet along the side because you can't push your cart out of the way and swing around and sit in front of the patient. Remember, you've only got three or four minutes to establish this trust, you, you need every little crutch you can use. And if you're sitting there talking to the side of the patient, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle, believe me. I want to be, I, wa I want to be, if I'm talking to a patient, I want to be like this. 
I want to be talking to you like this. I don't want to be talking to you like this, right? Okay. This is a sore, sore subject for me about presenting the fee. It's sore because I have not been successful in, in getting TDOers to present the fee. And if you do not, I'm going to say this, if you do not present the fee, you are making a huge mistake. Absolutely a huge mistake. Why do I say that? Because your patient has a right to know what this costs. And it is not the job of your front office person to do this. That patient has a right to know what it costs. And you should look at this as an opportunity, not as an embarrassing situation where you have to talk about money. Because you're not talking about money. You're talking about value. You know, I'm proud of what I do. I love to talk about the fee because it gives me a chance to explain the, my value. I want to do that. Look at what Peter Adia said today, or yesterday. He had all this stuff that no one ever talked to him, how much it was going to cost, what it was going to do. No one, ever, no one ever talked to him about any of this stuff. Now you have the stuff in the New York Times that they posted on the chat, TDO chat the other day where the guy went into the hospital and, and all these people saw him and he got a bill for, what was it, $200,000 or something. You know, and this guy was ticked off. I mean, what, where does this come from? Your patients have a right to know and that is your job and you want it to be your job. Do you think your front office person can explain your value better than you can? I don't care if you do insurance or not. It's an opportunity for you to explain what your value is at a time when you have the drawings up. So if they have a question about the value, God, why is this so expensive? What does my insurance cost? Why does it take so long? All of these questions are addressed on this page where you have the ability to bring up. I can show them some 40-minute molar endo. I can show them what that looks like. And that's the time to do it, right? That's the time to show them what sloppy endo looks like and why you, you refuse to work that way. So you use it as an opportunity to explain your value. It isn't, a, it isn't about the money. It's about your value. And, you know, you're in TDO. You should be proud of that value. You know, I charge a lot of money for what I do, but I think I should probably charge more. You know, these guys doing these one-shot 40 million, they make a lot more money than I do. I should be making more. My fee should be higher. That's the way I feel. So, as a post-grad, what you want to do, because this in itself is an art. It's not easy talking about money with a patient, is it? You should practice this with every patient. I don't care if it's a welfare patient or what. Why not practice it? Get good at it. Learn how to answer objections. You know, a lot of times when you're answering objections about patients, it isn't the actual answer. It's the time you took to formulate the answer. All of your answers should be automatic. <clears throat> you should have it practice. You should be able to do it instinctively. I had a patient the other day. Yeah, what kind of, what kind of discount do I get if I pay cash? Uh, well, actually, actually, Mr. Jones, that's all I take is cash. Bingo, just like that. <clears throat> Well, what kind of discount do I get if I'm a senior citizen? Well, actually, Mr. Jones, you know, 90% of my patients are senior citizens. <laughs> you know, bingo, right? I, got, I, got, I can answer any objection that a, a patient has, but it's, it's a practiced art. If you stumble and fumble and delay, you don't want to do that. So you have to practice it. The time to, pract the time to make the errors is when you're a postgrad. So use TDO and practice it. I don't, it doesn't make any difference if it's a Medicare or welfare patient. Practice it on them. If you can do it well with them, you can do it with anybody. <clears throat> hmm? I do have a can't. Uh, well, I have, 
It isn't a canned answer because it, all of these, each of these conversations is completely un, unique unto themselves. But I, I do have, I know what to say. I don't have to think about what I'm going to say to any of these objections. Could you, could you give an example of you finished doing the presentation, the person know they need the root canal, and now you're going to talk about the financial side from your end? Mm -hmm. How would you go about bridging that? Mrs. Jones, the fee for this procedure is $2,000 and I'll need to see you a minimum of three times and maybe as much up to four or five times. I'll tr try to do what I do. You never end the conversation with the fee. Okay, that helps. It isn't Mrs. Jones, the fee for this root canal is $2,000. So, Mrs. Jones, the fee for this root canal is $2,000 and I'll need to see you at least three times for that. Yeah. Um, if, if our practice does not have 90% Uh -huh. Retirees, so what do you suggest that we say if we don't want to give senior discount? They ask you for it. Uh, well, I don't know. You'd have to think of something. I mean, most of my patients are senior citizens, but you, you, yours aren't. Your fee should be lower then. <laughs> <laughs> you're get, if you're getting carious exposures. <laughs> So that's, people often ask, because I've been very careful to separate the financial part of TDO from the clinical part. You'll notice on the calendar, th there's never a production number on the calendar. We've separate this out. So people said, well, God, why do you have the fee thing on the, on the case presentation page? Well, it's because when you do a case presentation, you need to, you need to discuss your fee with them. Yeah. I'm running... I'd, I want to make sure I get done on time here, Mark, because Garth, I want Garth to start a little early if I can. The other thing I, I want you to do as new grads is I want you to get some metrics on what your patients are thinking about you. And TDO has that built in. You measure patient satisfaction. They can fill this out on the web or you can give it to them by, in, in a paper form and ask them to fill out. It's only 12 questions. Or, 13 questions, and then that goes into TDO. It makes metrics. You can bring the metrics up, and it, it will show you how you're, how you're batting. Whether they perceived you as competent and caring, incompetent and caring, competent and uncaring, or incompetent and uncaring. And you should be in the 90 percentile in all of these things. It, 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 it grades you on a whole host of things, and if you do this, you'll have some kind of feedback that's valuable on what your patients think of you. And some of them will be brutally honest with you. Uh, it also grades your front office staff. It also grades your case presentation skills. How, Mrs. Jones, how well did you feel the procedure was explained to you? Okay, so these things are very, very powerful when you're starting your practice. <laughs> These are actually numbers from our, our practice. We measure how painful, how painful was, the, in, uh, was the local anesthesia. How much pain did you have after a procedure? <clears throat> Something uh, about leadership with your staff. What does, what, the people who work for you, what, what do they really want? If you simplify this down to the, the basic thing, they want to be given a job, they want to complete the job, and they want to go on to the next job. And if you can do that, you're going to have happy employees. Why? Because there's fulfillment in, in finishing a job. And um, I lost an employee very early in my career, uh, and I thought she was happy. And she just walked in one day and said, you know, Dr. Carr, I quit. And I couldn't believe it, because I'm such a nice person to work for. You know? <laughs> And I, I said, why, why are you quitting? She says, Dr. Carr, you never finish anything. She's got all these things dangling. She's going home at night worried about this, worried about that. Dr. Carr, you never finish anything. It wasn't anything really personal about me. It was the, it was the fact that I was just giving her stuff and there was no order, no system, no process that allowed her to have closure. They want to be given a job, they want to complete the job, and they want to go on to the next job. 
So th this is, we made this, it's comedic, but um, it's, it's so true. Jennifer, I'd like to make sure that I talk to Dr. Cancelier today before he leaves, okay? Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, make sure you get a hold of the UPS guy today, because mm -hmm. that package has to go out today, okay? Okay, Thanks. okay. Jennifer? Je Jennifer? Oh, uh, hold just one minute, please. Uh, can you call Elaine at Dr. Briscoe's office and make sure uh, that I get that full mouth series uh, before the patient's next appointment? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Jennifer, if Dr. Sharp calls today, I do not want to take the call. Just don't let him through. Tell, okay. him, I, tell him I'm not here. Okay. 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 Thanks. And Dr. Carr, don't forget, these reports have to be finished before you leave tonight. And while you're at it, don't forget to take out that ad for a new front office manager. Okay. So give your employees a sense of a process where they can have closure. Don't interrupt them while they're already busy with the task. Keep a list. Don't do it verbally. Use the TDO task list. Give them a list every day. They have a thing that they can do, and they can go home and they can relax. And they're not thinking, oh, I, got to, I forgot to do this. Oh, Dr. Carr told me to do this at the end of the day. I didn't do it. That's very stressful for people to work that way. Give them a chance to have closure and a sense of accomplishment, and you'll have happy employees. Thank you very much.